This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to the Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Quichu. And my name is Brian Pavan Crane. So today we have Yaniv Tal as our guest. Yaniv is the project lead at The Graph. You may have heard of The Graph. It uh, recently launched and The Graph is, is interesting because it, it solves a pretty prevalent pro problem in the Ethereum space and that is the, the centralization of Ethereum. No, I'm being facetious here, but uh, as many of you know, uh, dApps that are building on Ethereum are having to rely on uh, index data. So you know the, the blockchain itself isn't actually built to you know sort of index data and have that data readily available for DApps. And so what many DApps, when, what many DApps are doing is that they're building quite centralized infrastructure on servers and allowing DApps to query that 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 infrastructure with traditional Web two APIs. And so. This is obviously a, a problem if, if the goal of Ethereum is to build a world computer that's totally decentralized. So the graph is taking an interesting approach in that they're building a uh, graph database on top of Ethereum as a layer on top of Ethereum. Um, and we sort of go into what a GraphQL database is, if you're not familiar with that technology, and allowing dApps to query that directly uh, so making it much more efficient. And so their goal is to have this become a decentralized marketplace for uh, indexes of the Ethereum data, uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So it's it's an early project. I think generally we 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 try to wait a little bit longer in a project maturity for um, to, ha to 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 bring the, the the project on the show. But in this case, we just thought it was such an interesting project and, and felt that uh, it was a good at least uh, now a good point to, to, to have them on and perhaps we'll have them on again in the future uh, when the project fully goes live and is fully decentralized. So last week I, I solicited contributions for the Wikipedia article. That solicitation is still open. So if you wanna to contribute to the Wikipedia article uh, that uh, is in draft, you can go to epicenter.rocks slash wiki and you'll get directly to the article. Uh, another thing that we should mention, and if you're hearing this, uh, that's good news because we've updated our podcast hosting service, which means that our feed has changed. And so your podcast app should have um, reset your feed. Uh, so you should be hearing the new feed. One thing you'll notice uh, that's different in the feed is that episode numbers are no longer in the episode title. And that's simply because modern podcast players have a, a, a native field for, for episode numbers. So you'll, you just won't see the episode number in the title anymore. Uh, if you're not seeing the episode numbers and you want to see them, then I would recommend, uh, you know, updating to a more mature podcast app. So like the iTunes app supports them, um, Pocket Cast supports them, this sort of thing. So just wanted to mention that. So without further delay, here's our interview with Yaniv Tal. So we're here today with Yaniv Tal and he's the founder and the project lead of The Graph. Now, we're going to speak with Yaniv about, you know, a lot of different things about querying and, you know, probably one aspect of the decentralized application Web3 stack that a lot of people are not as familiar with. So thanks so much for joining us today, Yaniv. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, maybe where we can start is if you can speak a little bit about how you became interested in blockchain and, you know, kind of the perspective you brought to blockchain. Sure. So I first started getting interested in the idea of blockchains in 2011. Uh, I, I think, you know, following, um, you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement, I became very interested in thinking through how we could improve governance and the economy um, through digital money. Uh, but I didn't actually um, get make it like a, you know, my day job until 2017. Um, so uh, a lot happened in between. I spent a lot of time at, at different startups. I did my own uh, startups with uh, uh, my co-founders here at The Graph um, and focused on developer tools uh, for quite a few years. And 
um, the perspective that I took into uh, blockchains was trying to figure out um, how to make it easier for people to build software uh, just in general. So um, we had a, a startup where we were doing uh, React developer tools to make it easier to build user interfaces. Um, we got into functional programming, looking at building on immutable data. Um, and, uh, and, and along that path, um, what got me really excited about Ethereum was uh, the idea that for the first time we could have this kind of global immutable database um, that uh, isn't just bounded by a single organization, but so that um, everybody can agree on a global state of truth. And um, that to me was just really exciting as being like a, a foundational primitive um, for um, just how software development could move generally. What was interesting, I listened to another interview you did, and it was interesting to hear you speak about blockchain kind of from this perspective of, okay, developer efficiency, you know, because generally when people speak about developing blockchain applications, everyone complains, oh, it's so inefficient, so hard to build. And, you know, there's these other benefits like maybe decentralization and you put up with all of the, you know, the, the hard time of developing something because there are those other things that, you know, make it so much better. And now you're kind of looking at it from the perspective, oh, actually, it can make it easier to develop. So I thought that was super interesting to hear. That's exactly right. And, and I think that this immaturity is just because it's a brand new platform. Um, and, you know, we've spent like 20 years um, building up the web platform to what it is today. Um, so at the beginning, uh, people were building their own servers, web servers in like C++. Right? And uh, that wasn't easy, uh, but they put up with it because, um, you know, the, the, the web was exciting for them. And, uh, and so similarly, I think, you know, we are in the infrastructure phase. And, and um, you know, I think uh, as we build out more of this infrastructure, um, there, it, there's no reason why it wouldn't be even easier to build on Web3 than, um, th than it is on Web2. And it, I'm, I'm quite confident that that'll be the case. But um, there's, there's plenty of work that needs to be done before we get to that point. So why did you guys uh, decide to start working on the graph? Um, well, we got interested in Ethereum seriously in early 2017. And uh, we started uh, you know, building different uh, dApps. And um, we quickly stumbled upon this problem that it's actually really difficult to get data that you need to power a web or a mobile app directly from an ethereum node you know I, I think we got into the space probably for a lot of like idealistic reasons the same reason a lot of other people got drawn to the idea of decentralization um, but uh, the graph specifically was basically um, partially realizing that um, there, this indexing and query layer is completely missing from um, the, the Web3 stack today. And, um, and we've actually spent a lot of time uh, working on this part of the stack at previous companies. Uh, so, for example, at our last startup, um, we built a custom framework on top of an immutable database called Datomic. And we built um, you know, this GraphQL-like query language uh, on top of this uh, immutable database. And um, we just did that kind of out of passion just because you know, we're, uh, we're, we're always trying to refine um, you know, what's just the best way to build software, right? what are the right abstractions um, just for building applications. And, and so you know, we, we'd already spent a lot of time thinking about that before we got into Ethereum. And then when we saw that this part of the stack was missing for Web3, um, you know, that we, we decided that's where we'd focus our efforts. One thing I thought would be interesting to speak a little bit about and that, that I thought was really fascinating is the way you guys described kind of the problem of, you know, the way databases and APIs work in, you know, Web2 and, you know, the, the kind of effects of that, such as rigidity of APIs, duplication of data, data and effort. Can you explain a little bit, um, you know, how that works, what's the status quo here and what are some of the downsides of the status quo? Yeah, so, you know, today every 
Web2 companies basically running a, a fully vertical stack, right? They, they manage the infrastructure, the database, the application, um, you know, the, the user interfaces. And you really have to, you know, trust these companies um, to kind of, uh, you know, continue to manage this data and, and make it uh, available to, to their applications. And, um, you know, you end up with these kind of data silos. Uh, where, um, you know, the, the model for Web2 is, you know, you build some kind of, you know, process around some data and then you restrict access to that data. Um, and, uh, you know, that is generally called like a moat. And, you know, how well you're able to build a moat basically determines, um, you know, how successful of a company you are in Web2. And, um, you know, I think that's just very limiting for, um, you know, uh, enabling uh, innovation to continue. And if, if you kind of look at this larger arc of, um, you know, software development, um, it's taken maybe 20 years to really figure out how to build applications that people really want to use, um, you know, even just on the web. And, you know, we've seen the transition from, you know, PHP to you know Ruby on Rails to client side frameworks and microservices and uh, data science and, and all of these different disciplines um, where we we're just figuring out how do you actually de deliver software at scale globally on the web and um, you know the companies that uh, you know figure this out were able to you know build these moats and data silos where they um, control access to that data. Um, but we've kind of gotten to a point now where, um, first of all, uh, these are more or less solved problems. And so people now know actually like how to build uh, full stock um, web applications that scale globally. And yet we've continued to have these kind of, you know, monopolies um, that now kind of con control access to that data. And so it seems to me that the next kind of phase uh, here is to basically commoditize uh, what you know we've collectively learned, um, and to actually you know make that data um, more generally available, um, so that we can continue to make progress. And and then uh, the thing that you guys described, I thought was nice. No, is is if you have like the, the current paradigm where you know, I, I have some data and maybe I make an API available, but then I have to decide, you know, what, what gets exposed in what way. And so I have to somewhat anticipate what people are going to try to build with it. Right. And then if they try to do something else, it doesn't really work. Right. So, yeah. So, so that, that's a big problem, uh, with, with rest. So basically the, the way rest has kind of evolved is, um, initially, uh, the idea is you have one endpoint per resource. And that way, if you have, you know, some interface that requires you to combine multiple resources together, then you can make several round trip calls to each of those different endpoints. And that's how you get your data. Um, and as we try to build applications that load really fast, uh, we realized that you actually can't make all of these round trip requests because otherwise you're going to be staring at a spinner for too long. And so, um, what companies have ended up doing is building custom endpoints for their different user interfaces so that you can load the data that you need really quickly. Uh, but the problem is that now you have to basically, you have this tight coupling between that one API and the client. And, and so if I'm building a new feature, suddenly I need like, you know, a new field to put up in, in the interface. I have to go talk to the server engineer, ask them to add that field. Um, and, uh, it really slows down uh, the pace of uh, development. And so, you know, Facebook is a massive company. They're constantly adding features and building new products. And they, like everybody else, you know, was grappling with this limitation. And um, because of that, uh, they invented GraphQL, uh, which is a query language that is really built with clients in mind so that um, you can specify a schema upfront on the server, and then the clients can request uh, exactly what data they need and get just that data back in a single response.
Okay, that's that's a good explanation. And I, I think one way of looking at this issue is that you know APIs themselves are sort of data silos. So for every resource, there is a data silo. If the company building the API has actually need to for that silo, they'll build it into the API. Or if they think their users will have need for that silo, they'll build it into the API. So one way to look at this is to say, okay, if I need to know the data relative to the organization which is attached to a user, well, first I have to make a query to the user um, endpoint, which is kind of a silo in itself, and then that will return the data about the user, so name, you know, bio, photo, etc., and then an ID for an organization, which I then need to query to retrieve the information about that organization. So it, it, in this case, it would require two queries, whereas with something like GraphQL, you could do this in one query. Um, so you know, at this point, maybe let's let's dive into to GraphQL and you know how how that cha sort of changes the paradigm with re with regards to SQL and how we've been doing things for the last you know 20, 20 years plus yeah so uh, Gra GraphQL is a query language that is really built with um, application developers in mind and so uh, you can define your schema which is basically all the different entities and how they relate to each other so in the example you gave you say this is an organization, an organization has many members, and these are the different fields on, that organizations and the members have. And then uh, depending on what uh, screen I'm building, what particular user interface I want to build, I can uh, specify the fields that I want, and I can seamlessly traverse across these relationships uh, so that I can get uh, whatever data I want back in just a single response. So, so it's effectively putting a query language at the API endpoint itself. So rather than having a database that's within the company, you know, siloed, closed off, and then you need to build the, 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 the API endpoints for each of the queries that you think your users are going to be using, it's effectively putting the query language right at the, at the edge where the user can access it directly and make those complex queries in a very seamless kind of way. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, um, you know, there are a few, um, you know, restrictions on what you can do. So it's not as generally powerful as a query language like SQL, um, but it actually maps really well to um, what you need if you're building an application. So, you know, one of these limitations is that you basically need to know um, how all of this data is structured ahead of time. So you have to define that schema and um, if you have data that you want to be able to query, you can only query according to that schema. Um, but you know that actually is how most applications are built. So you generally know how your different entity types relate to each other ahead of time. And um, you can, for example, denormalize your data to make you know ag aggregations and, and various uh, computations that you want available ahead of time. Um, you can also parameterize these things. So, so GraphQL allows you to um, for example, if, if you uh, want to query a collection, you can uh, include parameters. Uh, so you can do, for example, pagination or filtering or any of these kinds of things. Um, but uh, essentially what you get back is uh, the JSON object that exactly matches the structure of um, those entities and fields that you requested. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started.
We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So there's a nice blog post, and we'll link to it in the show notes too, where uh, your co-founder talked a lot about, you know, kind of the benefit of GraphQL. And one of the ways he explained it was that with uh, SQL, Based databases, you have this overfetching and underfetching problem. Can you explain what that is and how uh, GraphQL solves that? Yeah, so so this is a, a problem with most REST API endpoints. Uh, so typically with REST, if you request a resource, you get back all of the fields that the server engineer thinks you might want for that resource. And so it might be that I want to uh, render a card that just has a user's name and profile photo, but if I request the user objects, I actually get back you know 100 different fields, everything that the server knows about that user. And so that's not very efficient. Um, the, the converse is um, maybe I want the user's uh, name and photo and also the count of their friends, but you know the only way that I can get back um, the friend information is if I, you know, uh, actually request all of their friend objects. And so now you're also sending me back, you know, one friend for, or, um, you know, object for, for each of those friends. And so, uh, so th these are the types of problems that you end up with with REST APIs all the time. And so, you know, GraphQL solves that very elegantly by um, just sending you back uh, the data that you're requesting, no more, no less. Okay, and so then this is something that Facebook basically built because, okay, of course, they have so many queries internally. They were just, okay, we need to, like, save costs, save bandwidth, make it more efficient, and build this kind of query language because of that. That's right. The, the, the other thing that Facebook deals with is, um, you know, with mobile apps, people tend to run old versions of um, these applications. And so they're supporting, you know, probably hundreds of different uh, client versions, if not more. And so that makes it really difficult if you have this tight coupling between the user interface and the, and the API, um, because, uh, you know, the backwards compatibility becomes a nightmare to support. Um, and uh, this is actually quite similar to, um, you know, the situation that we have in Web3, where you, you have a, a protocol um, that uh, is going to be supporting a large number of clients. You know, one, one of the big benefits of Web3 is you can have a lot of different applications built on top of, um, you know, these protocols. And so uh, to be able to support, uh, you know, multiple applications and multiple versions of those applications, you end up having uh, the same exact kind of situation. So in one of the blog posts um, that you've published, you mentioned that GraphQL will likely be the preferred query language and database uh, of the decentralized web. What did you mean by that? And why do you think that is the case? GraphQL has been uh, rising uh, in popularity just in traditional web development. Uh, so there's a lot of companies like you know GitHub and Twitter and um, uh, Yelp and, and and many others that you know have already switched to GraphQL, and so th this is already like a, a a really big trend happening in web development generally. And really, what what you need when you're building applications is essentially like a, a standard um, for uh, how you want to access uh, your data, and um, you basically need an abstraction. And and you know we believe that GraphQL basically is just kind of the right level um, for this sort of abstraction where um, you don't want to have to know, you know, what block some data was, um, you know, updated in and all of the like internals of a blockchain if you're trying to build an application. Um, and so uh, having an abstraction on top that is just the data model is, we think, um, you know, the right level for um, how people will choose to build their apps, and then you can kind of uh, uh, you know deal with all of the implementation details um, on the backside of that GraphQL API. All right, now switching over to DApps, then. So, how do these problems relate to the DApp space? I mean, because in the DApp space, we don't have databases or SQL or any of that stuff. We're just curing the blockchain, right? You know, why why would we need a database on top of the blockchain? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of the applications that were built in the early days of Ethereum were very simplistic. Uh, but, but you're exactly right that basically um, this indexing and query layer was completely missing from blockchains. And, um, you know, I think it's just uh, a function of, um, you know, these blockchains have a lot of work to do. Um, it's a lot of work just to maintain consensus. And so, uh, you know, Ethereum, for example, is, is focused on these like scalability problems and uh, how, how, how to make it so you can build these smart contracts. Uh, but indexing is is very much its its own kind of layer in the stack and it's its own problem altogether. And, you know, I remember when, uh, you know, people started building dApps on top of Ethereum, you know, maybe there's only 10 transactions that have gone into the smart contract. And so you want to view, you know, um, you know, your, your whatever your application is. And um, it's it's easy to. Uh, you know, just show 10 things on a screen and feel like everything's okay. But, but if you remember, um, you know, the applications that started taking off, suddenly, you know, there's like a hundred things on the screen, a thousand things on the screen, and suddenly you just have this really long list and you're scrolling really far. And, um, you know, anyone who's used like a, a good web or mobile app would, would never think to themselves that that's an acceptable experience. But, you know, we're you know, we've been kind of building toys and, and it's kind of this growing up process to go from having like a proof of concept to having an application that people are, are happy to, to use. And I think in that transition, a lot of people have realized that like, wait a minute, um, you actually need to be able to, you know, search for specific data and filter and sort and paginate. And um, these are all things that you need to have indexes to enable. And so... One company that I think has a you know quite significance in the Ethereum space is uh, Infura, right? Which is a consensus project that serves a, a tons of API calls. About you know, is that basically the problem that they aim to solve as well? No. So Infura doesn't do any indexing. Infura is just kind of a managed Ethereum node service. Uh, so it, it is nice to not have to sync a whole node in order to start interfacing with Ethereum. And so that's the problem that Infura solves. Uh, but then uh, the indexing problem actually happens a level on top. And so assuming that you can talk to an Ethereum node, uh, you, you, you basically have access to the JSON RPC interface. That's, that's the, the interface that the Ethereum nodes expose. And this JSON RPC interface allows you to get um, you know, certain fields that are stored in storage in your uh, smart contracts, um, but you're very limited in how you can access that data. And so, for example, if, if I've got some some field that's you know account um, that's stored uh, in my smart contract, then I can get that count. Um, but but if if I have like a, a list that's, for example, uh, let, let's say that I'm a marketplace and I have a bunch of different listings of things that people can buy and sell in the marketplace, and and I want to uh, filter to find a specific category of listings. And then I want to sort that to just get, um, you know, the most expensive items for sale in that category. Uh, for that, I need to be able to do filtering. And that's not something that is exposed in that JSON RPC interface. And it's not exposed because um, it would be too expensive to actually expose that without having indices. And, um, and these Ethereum nodes don't maintain these indices. And, and, and so um, that's that missing indexing layer. So how are dApps, uh, you know, and companies building dApps and all these projects that need indexing solving this problem now? Because a lot of dApps are relying on indexing of data in one form or another. And you know, Ethereum is fully decentralized. So there must be a, a way that we're dealing with this issue. Yeah. So. Um, Every project that has gotten to the point where they're trying to build a, a really good web or mobile application has hit this issue. And what most of them have done is built these custom proprietary indexing servers. So, um, you know, they're, they're like, you know, crap, we can't actually you know, run the queries that we need. And so let's, let's build a server that, um, you know, syncs data from, from, from Ethereum, stuffs it into a SQL database, uh, you know, and serves it over an API. And then our, our front ends will just hit 
that custom API. I'd say that that's probably what like 90 plus percent of the projects have done so far. Um, the other option is you, if uh, you want to keep your app completely decentralized, um, then you can try to just sync everything on the client. So basically, you know, in that case where you want to let people filter uh, particular listings, you could load up all of the listings on the client and then filter it locally on the client. And uh, there are a lot of applications that do that also. Um, so, you know, that second option only works when you have some small amount of data or if you're willing to make the users wait a very, very long time uh, before you can show them a screen. Um, so, so some applications have chosen to do that, but, um, you know, the, the alternative is you have to run and operate your own servers. And, you know, I it, it, it think it's, it's, it's one of these cognitive dissonance things where we're trying to build dApps and a big part of uh, building a dApp is this idea of, um, you know, it's completely serverless and you don't have to trust anyone to operate uh, servers and infrastructure. And yet, in order to build applications that are actually usable, uh, we have to do exactly that. Okay, so let me get this straight. Uh, just to, so so we, we're clear here. So currently, what you're saying is that 90% of Ethereum dApps are running their own proprietary software that's sitting on top of the Ethereum node that's being hosted on server infrastructure and they're serving SQL queries and or th through APIs allowing users that are using those dApps on their clients to query the databases of these centralized sort of choke points before they can even access the blockchain database. That's exactly right. Very well said. Okay, great. I'm glad we got that settled. Now, I'm being a little facetious here because this is something that I've, I've, I've kind of stumbled upon recently. I mean, I, I, I hadn't really realized to what extent this was actually happening. And through, through digging and, and speaking to a lot of DAP developers about uh, both you know, different uh, DevOps problems that they were having, realized that, yeah, this is a big issue. And one of the ways that people have talked to me about potentially solving this is making this proprietary layer open source. And so then the idea is that, you know, different people out of the goodness of their hearts would host this infrastructure. For example, you have, you know, DAP A and DAP A has uh, all this proprietary infrastructure. They open source that stuff and then users of those DAPs and maybe those who are you know, particularly interested in the, making sure that their DAP client runs well, and maybe they need access to certain types of data. Like for example, if you're running a fund on one of these dApps might host that infrastructure. And I just thought, well, you know, if you don't have the incentive mechanisms there to make that work, well, it's unlikely that we'll ever get, a, we'll get past this point of like hyper centralization. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Right. We want, um, you know, Web3 to operate on top of this like public global infrastructure. And if we want that infrastructure to be sustainable, then kind of payment needs to be built in. There needs to be incentives for operating the infrastructure. And that's the only way to ensure that it continues to be available. So my next question, and I guess to me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something about the, 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 the technical infrastructure of Ethereum, but why wouldn't we just have this query language built into Ethereum? Why would Ethereum nodes themselves simply not expose graph QL uh, endpoints so that the clients would have direct access to the node and direct access to these to these GraphQL uh, queries. So, so there actually is an effort to introduce GraphQL natively into the nodes as uh, uh, an, an improvement for JSON RPC uh, because uh, the Ethereum nodes actually do maintain a few indexes. Uh, so, for example, if I want to get the Ether balance for a particular account, that's pretty fast. Uh, because that is something that's indexed internally. Uh, so, so that is something that uh, we're going to be seeing. But um, the, the reason why the Ethereum nodes don't maintain more indices is that uh, maintaining indexes is actually really expensive. And um, which indexes to maintain is a function of which applications are getting built on top. So, you know, with traditional SQL databases, you usually have like a, a DBA for example, that's looking at like, what are the slow queries? You know, let's add, you know, these specific indexes to make these queries faster. And, um, you know, there's no way for the Ethereum nodes to know wh which indices are the right ones to maintain. And um, there's no incentive for them to do that. 
so you know, generally with software, we look to build things in stacks, right? Where there's like layers that build on top of each other. And um, you know, I think it, it really makes sense to separate out basically layer one um, from these kinds of, you know, you could call this almost like a layer two problem, right? Layer one is really concerned uh, with things like consensus and, um, you know, data availability. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, what they produce is blocks and a single, um, you know, global, uh, you know, state that uh, everyone can agree on. Um, and then the problem of how do you organize that data so that it's easy to access for all the different applications um, that want to build on top um, really sits very cleanly as a separate layer on top in the stack. Cool. Well, let's let's dive in a little bit in you know the graph. I mean, we've spoken about the problem of databases and querying in a traditional web application in the decentralized context. We spoke a little bit about GraphQL. So, what is it that the graph brings to the table? So, the graph is an indexing and query protocol for blockchains and storage networks. Uh, so. We index data from these different Web3 data sources and make it available over GraphQL. Um, so the very first thing that we set out to do was to basically build a standardized way of doing this indexing. Um, so you know, we, we've already kind of talked about how you know, uh, most of the projects in the space have done their own custom proprietary indexing servers. And um, you know, the first step towards um, you know, being able to kind of um, introduce this indexing layer in the stack is to basically come up with a, a standardized way of doing that indexing. Uh, so we launched our standalone graph node July of last year um, and open sourced it. And basically that defined the developer APIs uh, for building what we call a subgraph. And a subgraph basically defines how to do this indexing work in a way that um, can eventually run on a decentralized network. And essentially what you do is you define, um, here are the data sources that I want to listen to. Uh, here's a mapping script. So it's a Turing complete language, um, you know, or way that you can transform that data at ingestion time. And uh, here's the GraphQL schema for how I want to be able to query that data. And with that subgraph definition, uh, you now have a, a standardized way of indexing that data and making it available over GraphQL. Basically, the way it was before, right, is people built their own SQL databases and their own way of querying that database. And now you guys say, okay, there is basically a standard way of doing it. You can use this graph, uh, the graph node, and then use these subgraphs, which is basically kind of like, okay, I, I want to have this data as long as I comply exactly to this format, I can sort of add it. And, and is then in the end, the idea we, we will have a, the graph node that contains all of the different subgraphs, um, or, or would I have like maybe my local node with different subgraphs than, than you do? Well, it, it, eventually the goal is to um, combine all of these graph nodes together into a global decentralized network. Um, so any graph node itself can choose which subgraphs it wants to index. Um, and uh, what we want to do is actually open this up to uh, a global marketplace um, and, and, and use market forces to uh, do the resource allocation um, for which nodes are indexing what data. So yeah, let's, let's get to the, the public network, decentralized network in a little bit. But first, so right now you guys are running this as basically like a hosted service. Why did you decide to, you know, start with that? So, um, you know, we, we really believe in just shipping early and often and that the best way to build software is to get it in people's hands and to work closely with users in developing that software. And so it was really just kind of a pragmatic choice for basically um, coming up with what, what are these intermediate milestones that we can hit where we can, you know, ship something, um, make sure that we're solving real problems for developers and then improve it over time. 
so the, the first milestone that we had was just open sourcing the graph node. And uh, we learned a ton after that milestone because projects were able to build on us. And, um, and, and, and so we were able to like, quickly improve the software at that stage. But you know, it was still kind of, the, there was this barrier to entry where people would have to run their own nodes if they wanted to use it. And so the second milestone for us was launching the hosted service where we could run a bunch of nodes for you and you could just deploy to our nodes and we have a really nice user interface where you can see the status of as the nodes are like indexing these subgraphs and, and you can easily uh, run queries in the browser. Um, so you can like test as you're developing. And, um, and that's something that we launched uh, at Graph Day January this year. And, um, and uh, the, the next milestone for us is, is the hybrid network. And so it's really just kind of a, a practical intermediate step for making it really easy for people to build on the graph today. Right. So basically the, the choice that that would have then is today they can either, you know, build their own SQL database and they host it on their own server. They built their own like querying and API for that, or they do the subgraphs, which is a little bit like developing their API sort of, right. They, they define the data format and stuff. And then you you guys would host it, and they can just query that, and you basically offer it as a hosted service. Exactly, and and really, you know, we've been very kind of transparent about our goals to build this decentralized network um, from uh, the very beginning. So our model for the hosted service is uh, we are going to be releasing a paid tier, and the idea is to essentially just kind of cover the costs of running the infrastructure. Um, because, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's really important that, um, you know, payment is built in and that this infrastructure is sustainable. And so, um, you know, this is kind of one step along, um, you know, the path of, uh, you know, launching the decentralized network. But, um, you know, this way it's, it's really easy to kind of get started and we can start proving out a lot of, um, you know, these pieces that need to be built on top. And so what about the hybrid network? What's that going to look like? So the, the hybrid network is um, that our next milestone where we no longer are running all of these indexing nodes. Um, so uh, in, in, in the hybrid network, we're going to have, um, uh, we're, we're going to introduce our, our work token. So um, uh, we, we've released uh, at Graph Day, Brandon Ramirez gave a uh, research talk where he described a bunch of new details about our decentralized network design, and we re re published the specs for, for the hybrid network. So you can check that out if you go to uh, github.com slash graph protocol slash research. The, the token has uh, two uses in the network. One is a work token um, it, for people that want to run these indexing nodes. And the second is uh, for uh, data curation and, and staking on the subgraphs themselves. Uh, so for the, the work token uh, model, um, anyone can come in and uh, you know stake tokens to run a, a, a graph node, and then they can charge uh, fees per query. Um, and that's done in an open marketplace where they can set their own prices per query. And so in the hybrid network, um, we're going to open it up so that um, other people can run these nodes, but um, we're going to be running a centralized uh, fisherman service and graph protocol. The company is going to be very involved in kind of enforcing security in the network in this kind of like intermediate uh, phase. So a couple of things here, and I guess we're reg reg regarding scaling. How does this scale? Because it occurs to me that so one, you know, the Ethereum blockchain is already quite large, you know, several hundred gigabytes. Now, if you have to build an indexing service that has all of this data, but then you know, structured in a way that presumably makes it much larger, how do you deal with that? But then also the other question is, you know, you mentioned earlier that with GraphQL, you have the schemas and it's unclear to me how we're going to come up with a, a general, a generally agreed upon schema that everybody agrees, like this is a schema that Ethereum should have 
and that is optimized for all of the different dApps, right? So like one, I mean, unless I'm missing something here, but one dApp might require a different data schema than another dApp. Yeah, great, great question. So, so first on, on the scaling part, you're exactly right. Um, from a, a sheer amount of data perspective, the graph is probably going to be like one of the, the largest networks in terms of just uh, how much data we need to um, you know, store and make available. And, um, and, and that's really kind of what our layer in the stack is focused on. And so, for example, you know, that's why we kind of have sharding, which right now is kind of at the subgraph level. And then it's actually going to be down to the individual index level. Each graph node only needs to index some very small subset of the data. Uh, but yeah, to make data you know, very quickly accessible to clients all over the world, you would really need to scale that out to, to many, many nodes um, that are geographically you know, distributed at the edge. And, and that's a core part of what we need to do. Now, as far as uh, coming up with these uh, you know, uh, schemas, uh, that's where you know, governance comes in. So uh, right now, anyone can define their own schemas for their particular application for their subgraphs. And so you can think of subgraphs as being like kind of a unit of governance. Um, but over time, one of the problems that we would love to solve is to you know, add this layer of governance for these subgraphs and uh, for these uh, you know, uh, data types to exactly solve uh, the problem that you're describing, which is, you know, if if I have like a very custom application, um, you know, I should be able to define my own schema and not have to talk to anybody. Uh, but one of the big benefits of Web3 is to enable interoperability. And if you want to, you know, provide these APIs and you want to make data available so that many different applications can be built on top, then you do need to have some coordination. Uh, so, you know, we've seen like standards bodies in the past that try to come up with, you know, standardized, you know, data formats and, the, and these standards bodies tends to move really slow. And, you know, this is something that really excites me about Ethereum that we actually now have like a platform that enables kind of large scale coordination. And um, my hope is that we can build great governance systems on top where, for example, people can, you know, vote on uh, changes that they want to make to these uh, globally shared schemas, and that this can create a scalable way of evolving standards um, that enables for a lot more interoperability. So, so you mentioned that you guys will need sharding, and that there, you know there could be or initially some sort of shard that you have, you know, per subgraph, you know. But, but what's the timeline here? I mean, sharding it seems to be not super close, right? If you look at all of the sharding efforts, like when, when do you think, like, yeah, what's the sort of timeline for like the hybrid network when that's gonna launch and, and uh, like a sharded network? Well, luckily um, the problem is, is quite a bit easier for us than it is for these layer one blockchains. Um, so, you know, layer ones are responsible for solving things like data availability and, um, you know, a, a whole set of issues that um, we don't need to solve, right? Because at our layer of the stack, uh, we only accept these like, you know, strong layer ones as inputs, right? as our data sources. And so we get to assume that that data will always be available. And um, all we're doing is processing that data and indexing it to make it uh, more easily accessible. And so at our layer of the stack, all we're concerned about is kind of quality of service. Um, you know, if for some reason, you know, an underlying shard kind of goes offline, like, you know, we can always rebuild the index. And so that makes sharding a lot easier for us than for some of these other ones. Yeah, let me see if I understand that because, you know, I guess if, you, let's say you look at Ethereum and the sharding there, well, what's, what's hard is you have these different shards and then you have like, they have to basically be able to communicate with each other. Like you have these co smart contract calls across shards and you know, it gets very complicated. But here it would be like, okay, I want a node on the graph and I can just go and I say, okay, I'm gonna go on the auger subgraph and I just take that, you know, that kind of schema and I had just have that data and I don't have to care about any other subgraph, right? I just have to be able to serve uh, that information. Is that roughly correct? 
Yeah, so as long as you have access to the underlying data sources that you need to process your subgraph, then um, you know, you're good to go and you can build up your index and, and you can start serving clients. So another question that came up for me is that, you know, even at course one, you know, we have a Cosmos Valley, we've been doing some of this stuff, right? Like getting the data out of blockchain, putting it in the SQL database, reading it out. And, you know, let's say different projects will have their own, you know, maybe analytics or insightful things like proprietary stuff that they're doing and that they may not want to expose exactly what they're querying. Because, uh, you know, I could imagine if you can, like, see all of the queries that Coinbase is doing, like, maybe you can figure out what they're going to develop next. Or uh, So how does privacy work in the graph network? Yeah, so I, I think there's uh, a lot of use cases, like you're describing, if people are doing, like, prop trading, uh, things like that, where um, they don't want to make that data available to others. Um, and uh, for that, you wouldn't need to use the graph. Uh, it might be that you actually still want to build on the graph because it just makes it easier uh, f f for you to use those tools internally, but then you'll you'll just use it offline. You can run your own graph node. It's all open source, and so uh, that option is available to you. Um, you know, the network that we're building is, is all around public data, and, you know, we think that there's going to be uh, more and more in you know many orders of magnitude more open data that's going to become available as part of this move to blockchains and so there if you have data that you want to make available to, um, you know for for other developers and for for different applications um, that's when when you would use the graph well yeah actually I think that's a good point right because you could just like run your own the graph node with the this necessary subgraphs and then query that and then that's not visible to the network right right yeah so so you 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 have that option available just like you can run your own private ethereum um you know network yourself if, if you want to do that so moving now to economics um we talked about the hybrid network a little bit so talk about some of the you know game theory and economics that go into the um the, the hybrid networks, which which is sort of the next phase um, in in the life of the product. Yeah, so um, you know the, the the first step is making sure that um, you've got indexing nodes that are incentivized to to index data sets. So um, you know the the, the main uh, incentive for the nodes is that they can set their own prices um, per query, and so. Um, you know, they can set those prices based on uh, essentially demand. Uh, so if there's a subgraph that isn't being used a lot and they need to cover their costs of doing the indexing, then they could set the prices higher. Um, if, you know, it's a really profitable subgraph, people are querying it all the time, uh, that they can set the price lower. And, um, and, and that's essentially the incentive. Then you want to have, um, you know, an incentive for people to, to add data uh, onto the graph. And um, so we've got this kind of curation, um, which is basically you can stake on a, a subgraph and uh, that entitles you to future revenue that's proportional to the number of queries on that subgraph. Now there's actually a, um, uh, you know, a lot of things that could make doing that uh, quite difficult, and this is you know one element of the game theory that gets um, you know quite interesting. Uh, so you would want to make it so that if I you know create a valuable data set, then uh, I can make more money, uh, and and that creates an incentive for people to add more and more valuable data onto the graph. Uh, but but that can actually be quite easy to game, right? So um, you know for example um, you know maybe I could find a subgraph that's doing really well and I could copy it and then try to get people to use my subgraph instead of yours. Right? Um, I could choose to uh, run my uh, a graph node and then um, query my own query myself where I'm just paying myself so I'm just moving money from my left hand to my right hand to make it look like there's a lot of demand uh, for this data set uh, when really I'm just paying myself. Um, so. Um, in order to, you know, actually make it so that you can create like a, a long-term incentive 
uh, for adding valuable data to the graph, we have to like, you know, solve these kinds of problems. Yeah, no, that, that reminds me a lot of like ocean protocol that, you know, spent some time looking at, cause they have a lot of the same, same problems. And it, I think it's pretty, pretty tricky to get the game theory and incentives right there. Yeah. Now, um, you know, one thing that we're doing, you know, very different is that all of this is for public data. And so we're not trying to solve the problem of, um, you know, someone's keeping this data private and you have to kind of like set up an agreement in order to access that data, because we think that ultimately most information is going to be public. Information wants to be free and, you know, for the, the, next like evolution of, of the web, we should just assume that that's going to be the case. But just because information is free and available, it doesn't mean that you're not willing to pay for fast, efficient, secure access. Right? And so what you're paying for isn't really for the information, but it's for the work that somebody is doing to organize it and make it easily accessible to you. Um, so, you know, one way of thinking about it is like, you know, maybe Uber. So, um, you know, if I want to, you know, travel somewhere in San Francisco, I can walk, right? Uh, that option is available to me. Nothing's stopping me from, you know, uh, you know, tying up my shoes and, and walking five miles. But um, if I want a car to take me to my destination a lot faster, then I can pay a little bit of money and uh, you know, get in a car and I can get there you know, significantly faster. Um, and you know, how fast I can get to my destination is basically a function of the number of cars that are uh, moving around the city. So if Uber only had 10 cars, then you know, it would take me longer to get a car. And um, you know, if, if Uber has you know, ten, thousands or tens of thousands of cars in a city, then the average time that I have to wait to get a car is gonna be significantly shorter. And so this is kind of, you know, a way to think about like, you know, li liquidity in like, you know, an indexing marketplace where, um, you know, essentially you have this two sided market where, you know, you have like the data producers and uh, the data consumers and uh, you want to have like a thriving marketplace where there's incentives for both sides um, to provide the service and, and to consume the service. So that's an interesting point then to look at this as, as a marketplace and it ties into my next question, which is, you know, what are the, what are the costs that we're looking at here? So already as a, as a DAP user, there are costs associated with using the Ethereum network and making transactions and, you know, people are working on ways to, you know, improve things like, you know, like reducing the cost of maintaining state, for instance, um, but there's, there's a bunch of costs there. And then for DAP developers, there's costs as well, uh, whether those be you know, development costs uh, or costs to store data. So there's already a bunch of costs here. And then also, you know, what, with, with this marketplace that is like a layer on top, you're introducing another set of costs, which is to access data, and like indexes and things like this. Um, what, what are your thoughts on you know, the, the increasing costs of using a blockchain and adding more layers of costs there. Yeah, so, you know, blockchains today are expensive, um, but I would expect to see the cost go down significantly. Right? If, if you have computation that you need to have replicated on tens of thousands of machines, that's going to be expensive. And if you have data that you need to make available forever, that's going to be expensive. Uh, but, you know, I think... Uh, you know, we're already seeing a lot of, you know, new designs for blockchains that should be able to make it significantly cheaper and, you know, maybe different applications need different levels of security and, 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 um, and, and, and so I, I think we'll see those costs go down. Um, for the data layer, we, we are introducing a, a, a cost, um, but it's significantly cheaper. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see the costs end up somewhere around, you know, 0 0.0001 cents per query, right? Like if, if you actually think about the cost of computation, it's actually one of the cheapest things that a company, um, you know, uh, spends money on. So it, like, you know, in a traditional startup, you know, may, maybe you're spending, you know, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars on server costs, at least, you know, in the early days. Whereas maybe you're spending, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars a year 
uh, per engineer. Uh, so, you know, I think actually the kind of social scalability costs, I think, are uh, much more important to consider than the raw cost of computation. And I think that um, when you actually build the payments into the protocols, I think in the end we're going to see um, that uh, you know it, it, it ends up being cheap enough when all is said and done. So today, you know, most people are probably worth, you know used to spending thirty dollars a month, maybe on like oh, actually it's probably more like seventy dollars a month for like you know your your mobile um, you know broadband. You're used to spending on uh, you know your different services uh, like your Netflix and 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 whatever else. And and I think that with Web three. Um, you know, people are, it, you know, going to have to, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of a new category. It's a new expense uh, for sure that people need to get used to like, hey, I am now paying to access like Web3. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, we, we can kind of look at how much that's going to cost in total and what users are going to get back um, in return. And I think it's going to be more than worth it to basically have you know an explosion in the number of applications that you can use that all interoperate and i think that the kinds of apps that will be able to come out of that are going to be more than worth the cost so right now you guys are focusing on ethereum is is the idea that this is going to be you know the graph is going to be this network that's going to index you know all of the data of all of the blockchains and make it queryable or are you so what's what's the plans there yes that's the vision <laughs> so <laughs> Very good. yeah we're going to index all the data and um you know i think that is going to become increasingly important as we see more and more blockchains but already you're seeing just with ethereum a lot of people are choosing to go to infura for example, because it's just an easier way to access data. And imagine what's going to happen when there's, you know, 10 or 20 different blockchains and each one has many different shards and you have to figure out which full node to go talk to to get what data or you're, you know, you yourself are going to have to start running 50 full nodes. Um, it's not really going to scale. And so I think it's, it's you know, that, that makes it even more important for there to be like a single uh, network that's indexing all of the data across all of these different data sources and making it easily available. You know, one thing that that um, you know I, I would want to kind of mention here is that we, we're essentially acting as a sort of aggregator. Uh, Web three is you know all about decentralization, and you know we've got you know these different networks, and and you want everything to kind of be decentralized, um, but. Uh, you know, from a user perspective, there's a reason why aggregators exist. Um, you know, if, you know, the web itself was decentralized, but like if I couldn't go to google.com to search for something and, and find a website, um, you know, those web pages wouldn't be very useful to me. Um, similarly, there's lots of different, um, you know, uh, items that are for sale and different merchants on Amazon. But if I couldn't browse and search for items for sale, um, those merchants wouldn't be much, much use to me. And so um, you always have this kind of aggregation um, that becomes important to, to make things usable. Um, and, and typically, um, you know, those aggregators become your kind of centralized points of failure. And that's exactly why um, decentralization is so important to us. Because you know, we, we want to make Web3 usable, but we think it's really important that if you have this global API that's indexing all of the world's structured information and making it available, um, and that every application can use this global API to access its data, that it's really important that that API is not owned and controlled by a single company or, you know, a single entity. And, and so, um, you know, that's why we're so passionate about making this a decentralized network. So some projects are already uh, using the graph. So you recently, I think in February, had uh, this event in San Francisco and um, so, you know, several projects uh, participated and spoke there. And there you unveiled uh, the, the um, 
the hosted version of the graph and the graph explorer, which I, from a product perspective, like I thought looked really nice. I, I played around with the explorer and um, it looks like you guys spent a lot of time on like design and making sure that it's quite usable and like developer docs and things like this. So can you tell us a little bit about the projects that are using the graph now and maybe highlighting one that comes to mind and how they're using uh, the product? Yeah, so uh, we do have uh, a bunch of projects using the graph already. Uh, one that I'm really excited about is Moloch. So if you go to MolochDAO.com, uh, that's actually uh, using the graph to power that user interface. Uh, so um, I'm sure many of, of your listeners know Moloch is a DAO for funding Ethereum infrastructure. And um, it's got members, and those members vote on different proposals uh, for how they'd like to spend their funds. And all of that is being indexed on the graph and um, empowering their user interface. Uh, so uh, you can go to um, uh, the Graph Explorer to find all of this data that's being indexed and is available for people to build applications um, at thegraph.com slash explorer. And um, you can see a bunch of featured subgraphs there right now, and then a bunch of community subgraphs. Uh, so it's really easy for uh, anyone who like, wants to build a subgraph. You can deploy it to the hosted service, and it'll show up in the Explorer. And we just want to grow um, the amount of data that's being indexed and is available to people that want to build applications. Cool. So let's let's talk about uh, you know, before we wrap up timeline and you know what's the roadmap. So how how long should it be before like the hybrid network is released and what are some important points on the roadmap coming up? Yeah, it's, um, we've got a bunch of features that we're going to be adding this year. Um, so, uh, one of the big ones is expanding to multiple blockchains. We've got, uh, things like pending transactions and, um, something called the, the confirmations API that we're really excited about. So, um, you know, right now, when you query the graph, it just gives you back the latest state that it knows from whatever Ethereum node it's connected to. Uh, but we think that uh, one element that's been very overlooked in, um, you know, building uh, dApps is communicating to users kind of the finality of various actions um, that, that are taking place in the interface. So, you know, a typical UI that you'd see today is you perform some action and then it sends you a link to Etherscan where, you know, you pop over to this other, you know, website to kind of see if this transaction has been accepted in a block. And, you know, we've all kind of put up with this, but I think it's a really great example of like a UX, uh, you know, paradigm that uh, is not going to scale to mainstream users. Uh, and so being able to actually show in the interface, like, you know, when, um, you know, a, a transaction has been accepted, when this action has been performed, you know, this, you know, if, if I'm looking at a, 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 a crypto collectible and it says that I own it, um, you have I owned it for a while or has this just changed as of, you know, two blocks ago? Uh, so, um, so that's the confirmations API uh, coming later this year. We've made a lot of progress on, on the hybrid network. So like I mentioned, the, the specs are already available. We'd love for people to jump in and provide feedback. We've actually built the first uh, version of the smart contracts uh, to run that. So we're doing a lot of like, you know, testing and development internally. I would expect it in the early part of next year, uh, but uh, uh, generally try not to comment on, on dates too much. But um, but that's that's kind of the roadmap and, and really what we're focused on this year is is really just getting adoption because we think the uh the most important thing is um to to help dApps build use usable you know uh, experiences as soon as possible and um you know there's there's something nice about this progression of actually starting centralized and decentralizing over time is it, it allows us to you know iterate a lot faster and um, you know, if, if we get to a point where there's, you know, a hundred or more applications that are built on top and the graph works really well for them, then we know that by the time we, you know, launch the decentralized network and it open it up to many more nodes to be doing the indexing that we have something 
um, that works really, really well. Yeah, Neva, it was very interesting to be speaking with you about the graph today and, and uh, great to have you on to discuss this topic. I think, you know, as, as I was alluding to earlier, you know, too much centralization in, in Ethereum obviously isn't desirable. And that's really what we, the situation that we're in at the moment, at least for most dApps. So the vision of the graph is one that I think will resonate with a lot of people and kind of goes in the direction that I think the original ideas behind Ethereum meant to lead us towards. Um, one, one, I guess, I wouldn't want to call it a criticism, but one thing that we should be, I think, careful about is you know creating too much dependency on one service. For so, for example, if you know for for any any additional layer that sits on top of Ethereum, I don't think it would be much better if you know every DApp in the ecosystem would now depend on that one layer, and you know should that layer cease to function or the economics are flawed or for some reason no longer really works, well, then you have a situation where it's not a whole lot better than, than a centralized um, platform. But uh, hopefully you know, the standard will allow for a multitude of marketplaces and similar types of products to emerge where you know, people can choose you know, which version of the graph they're, they're pointing their dApps uh, towards. Yeah, I, I think this idea of having it be a open right which means open source so you can run your own nodes and and um you can verify everything yourself and and uh you know you can experiment and um and and that nobody's kind of locked into to any one particular uh solution is is really important and um and so we we agree with that that vision uh you know completely great well thanks for coming on and we look forward to seeing future developments uh of the graph and so we will be linking to uh, everything we've talked about, the, uh, the blog posts, the website, the Explorer, uh, the GitHub and everything in, uh, in the show notes. Is there any, anywhere else uh, that you would like to point people uh, if they want to get involved other than, other than those resources I already mentioned? Yeah, we're most active just on Twitter and Medium. Great. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.